Hello and welcome to the Land Kit Planting Workflow, where we'll learn how to explore planting on our site using Land Kit's rules-based planting tools. These tools allow us to define the characteristics of our site and then automatically place plants in our defined planting areas based on their characteristics and constraints. You'll notice that we have our grasshopper minimized down here in the corner, and we'll be controlling that grasshopper using the workflow panel here, as well as the template of layers set up here in the Rhino file provided. The first tab that we'll be paying attention to here is the info tab, which gives us a little bit of an overview about how this workflow functions, as well as what kind of geometry go in the different layers. All right, let's take a look at the plants tab where we'll learn about how to import plants with their characteristics and their constraints to be placed on our site and in our planting zones. So the first selection option we're going to talk about is called plants from CSV, and this allows us to import a CSV file. Now we're currently using the ERA database, which is a uh, open source plant database that has thousands and thousands of plants with their characteristics and constraints. And uh, you can actually modify um, your own CSV file in order to work with PlantKit by just looking at the ERA database's uh, formatting settings for the different plants and their characteristics, and then sort of following that formatting approach. And then you can just simply import your own CSV file. So the uh, next option that you have for all the different selections of plant list sources is the save plant list. So if you have a series of plants that you're looking at in your plant schedule that you really like, you can save that file and that's where you will load it later from the .land file. So um, this allows you to just save your plants, whether you're on the plants from CSV or you're working with the AI prompt. So the next option here is the ability to switch the number of species that we're pulling from the overall list. So we can actually pull a fewer number of species or we can pull a slightly larger number of species. But if your plant uh, list for um, the site that you're working on is much longer than 100, um, then you won't be able to pull all those species unless you modify under the hood. But um, it allows you to sort of select a much lower number to explore the different species that you might be interested in using on your site. Um, it also helps improve the processing speed because if you're trying to filter through thousands of plants, it can take quite a bit of time. Now, if we look at this other selection here, we have filter plants without color. So what it allows us to do is it allows us to choose all plants or to filter out the plants that we're using on our site by only the ones that have colors assigned to them in the database. So you can see all of these plants have a specific color to them, as where is if we switch it back to all plants, you'll see that some of the plants have gray, indicating that there is no color listed in the database. So it will produce a color for you, pretty much always this gray color, um, if you don't have an assigned color. But um, if you want to sort of make sure that you're filtering your list by plants that actually have colors represented, then you can do so right here. Another lovely thing that you have as an option for your filtering is the state that you're working within. So currently we're in PA, but maybe we want to switch to New York. So we can just select New York state and it will filter the plants that you're pulling from your list by that state value um, in the column that is associated with um, the native species indicator. So we have, um, lastly here, before we get to the uh, check plant list, we have filter by plant types. And this is, allows us to say, okay, you know, I just want to work with grasses. I don't want any herbaceous plants. So we can actually filter out all the plants that are not grasses. And then we're only working with a list of 75 plants that have all the color, but let's switch that back to only plants with listed color. You can see they're pretty much all greens and yellows. And then we're filtering all these plants by, it looks like uh, Ohio State, I must have slid that down. So let's switch, switch that back to PA. And these would all be native grasses to PA that have colors assigned to them, 75 of them. We're gonna flick that herbaceous plant layer back on. And then we're gonna look at this last checked um, selection here. We have what's called check plants to include. So this is actually filtering out all the plants based on these specific selection options you have. So in all the plants that have colors listed, 
that are native to PA that are herbaceous and grasses are put in a list here at the bottom. And you can go through this and you can actually check off or check on the plants that you specifically want to work with. So this allows you to sort of look through a short list of plants and then choose specific species that are of interest to you. All right, so the next way of importing plants is through the AI prompt. So we already selected this option and it will take a little bit of time to process because it's communicating with OpenAI in order to use the ChatGPT function to pull plants off the internet, but then it's also formatting them appropriately to work with plant kit. So we have a couple different settings here that we need to pay attention to. The first one is the API key. You will need to purchase your own API key from OpenAI to use this function. Uh, they're very inexpensive and pretty easy to use. So um, uh, feel free to go ahead and give one a try for a little while if you want to play around with this a little bit. We also have our plant prompt. Now we typically will write this out in a different Word document or something and then copy it into this um, location in order to start pulling plants that match these different characteristics we've described. But this can be a full sentence, several sentences that you're just describing the, the types of plants that you want. And then the, the same uh, warning that is always given for anything using ChatGPT is just Remember that this is scraping from the internet, it's pulling information and it's formatting for your use. So it's a great way to explore or maybe see some types of plants that maybe you didn't expect could potentially work on your site. Um, but it's just important to pay attention to what you're importing and not just take it for granted that it's getting it correct. Another option here is called add more plants to list. So when you initially run this um, AI prompt, it's gonna give you 10 plants and then you can actually continue adding plants to that list by clicking this button. All right, so you'll see that we just added a bunch of plants here. You'll see it's not exactly 10 that we've added. Uh, we do have a filter to ensure that you're not getting duplicate plants. So that's something to make note of is that you might not get a full 20 once you add plants to list, another 10 of them. You might only get a few if it's pulling similar species from the internet. Um, so we have this plant list that's a little bit longer, and we can continue to add more plants to this list if we'd like more options uh, from the internet. You can see here we too also have a clear plant list, which will remove all the plants that we're showing here and, um, and just start from zero, and then you just keep adding more plants to list. Now this is a, a, a great use for the save plant list function. If I click the save plant list, I can actually go in and save it to a specific file. We'll call it the test planting. And then we have that saved as a .land file in there. So we can actually come to this last selection option, load plants from land file, and we can pull in a specific file that we want to use for our planting. You can see it's gonna take a minute to process, and then it's gonna pull in that old plant list that we were using before from the AI. All right, let's shift over to the constraints tab where we'll learn about how the different constraints that we can apply to the plants, the environmental design analysis layers, will start to affect the way the plants are being placed and the locations they're being placed on your site and in your planting zones. So the first dropdown we have here is site size. Um, this will affect the resolution of that environmental and design analysis that's happening. So a smaller site size will give you more points or more locations for analysis to take place. So it will give you a better accurate placement of that plant, but it will take longer to process. Um, a larger site size will have fewer points for analysis, so it will process faster, but it will be a slightly less accurate in plant placement. So you can play around with these and um, work within a site size that matches your site or a larger one in order to improve processing speeds and then get that higher resolution and detail once you have things sort of selected and the filters chosen that you want. We have a couple different plant layout styles here. We have the planting uh, area fill, and then we also have the pattern planting. We're gonna focus and just talk about the fill planting area first, and then we'll come back to the pattern planting. But we have a couple different selection options here available to us. We have sun exposure, which is currently being applied to the plants, and it can be difficult to see with the sun exposure because the site has a lot of trees and a few buildings as well that we're working with. And if we look at that in the 3D space, you can actually see those uh, trees and buildings. <clears throat> now, 
let's look at what happens when we apply a second layer of analysis to our site. So in this case, we're applying flower color and you can see that there are certain zones that don't have as many plants as others. So if we open this environmental layers here, you can see that we actually have flower color zones that we've specified. We've named them and applied a RGB value to them. And this is going to filter out any plants within these zones that don't have that flower color. However, each of these different analysis um, options have a set of parameters that can be applied to them. In this case, with the flower color, we actually have a sensitivity that allows us to pull in colors that are a little bit closer to that color. So if we look at this, it says a zero to 255 RGB value. So making this a higher number will allow more colors in that are closer to yellow and reducing that value will, will tighten up the colors that are allowed to be included in these zones to colors that are closer to yellow or yellow specifically. With the sun exposure, you can see that we actually have location data, uh, latitude and longitude data that we can enter in, as well as the time zone and the starting and ending, ending month for the growing period that you're working with in order to generate sun, part shade, and shade values for each of the different locations and areas on our site. Now, if we start to add in more layers, you can see if we add in the soil moisture, you're gonna notice that there's fewer plants on our site. And that's because we're dealing with multiple different layers. So the, the number of plants that can utilize each of these different analysis layers for each of the locations on the site is gonna be a smaller number than if you have fewer constraints that you're being, they're being applied. Another nice part about this is that the soil moisture is also just using curves to define the zones that we're working within. So we have our dry zones, these two zones here that we have circled in these planting zones. And then we have our moist zone, which is encompassing the entire site. And the nice part about this is, is that if you layer these together, the larger, um, the larger shapes will be superseded by these smaller shapes. So even though this moist zone encompasses these two planting areas here, the dry zones will supersede this larger zone so that it's only dry plant, um, uh, plants that prefer dry soils in these zones. Now, what's a way that we can get some of these plants to start packing in a little bit tighter? The first thing I want you to pay attention to is the initial plant density. So there are fewer number of species that can be placed on our site here, but if we wanna to start to fill in those species in the gaps that we're seeing, we can increase the density and it will start to take those plants that work on the site and then begin to fill them in more into those um, zones that are empty. So we have a one here, this is starting to get some better spacing. And then what we can do is we can do what's called packing plants, which allows us to shift the plants away from each other into the spaces that are not being filled currently. So if you look at this, you can see the plants start to shift a little bit into specific places. Um, and you can increase and decrease these packing steps to get them a little bit looser or a little bit tighter to each other. Okay, so the last um, uh, thing to look at here is the layout style. So if we drop this down, we can switch over to a pattern planting. And what this is doing is it's going to utilize paving kits patterning tools in order to generate grids um, based on these different patterns for the plants to be placed in. So if we decrease some of these the number of environmental analysis layers that we're using, we can see the plants start to, more plants start to appear and they start to fill in the planting area, but only according to the grid that we've applied. So we can actually change these grids around and actually see the different ways that the plants are being laid out on the site according to a pattern. All right, let's move over to the out tab where we'll learn about the different exporting types and visualization types that we have available to us. The first option here is overwrite baked plants. We recommend you keep this on as default because this is deleting out the plants and then replacing them with the new plants whenever you change the constraints or the different uh, plant filters that you're working with. Um, toggling this off could be useful in certain circumstances, but in general, having this toggled on is going to replace the plants that you're seeing on your site every time that you change some sort of constraint. Now we're also automatically baking the plants into the file. So um, if you turn that off, you're gonna be baking layers and layers of plants in your planting zones, which could be useful um, potentially, but um, in general for the explore exploration process, we recommend keeping this toggled on as yes but we have our different layers of species of plants here that you can see, and all of these plants are being organized appropriately into their species layer. 
Now here we have a couple different output types. The output types are also gonna affect what plants are being baked. So if we have circles selected, the bake type is gonna be circles. If we have the glyphs selected, it's gonna be glyphs. Both of these are the 2D block options. Those are super useful for exporting into something like AutoCAD. Um, uh, for refining your planting plan, but you can also utilize these different block types for replacements in uh, land effects using the mimic plant tools. Um, and so they, they will uh, translate into land effects plants very quickly and efficiently. So it, addition, in addition to having these 2D options, we also have some 3D options such as spheres and 3D, which creates a little 3D representation of the plant itself. So you can see that if we navigate to the 3D view, we actually have our plants being represented in specific shapes and patterns here in the 3D option or switching over to spheres. The handy part about these different output types is that you can actually export them to DAE files, which will make um, placing these plants and mass replacing the different species types in a software like Inkscape or um, Twinmotion or Lumion, very easy and efficient. Especially in Lumion, you can use the mass replace tools to quickly replace all of one species with a specific plant in, um, in Lumion. So the, um, the export to DAEs are options only for the 3D output types. Lastly, we have a couple of different um, environmental analysis preview options. These also include the design analysis options as well. So if we toggle this to sunshade, you can see how the trees that we have on our site and the buildings that we have on our site are actually affecting the solar analysis that's taking place. You can place those different objects in the environmental layers under buildings and trees. And you can see that it's generating this map here on our site of the different um, zones that have certain types of preferences. You can also see that when we switch to flower color, it's showing us those flower color zones that we're working with. And this is a great place where you can actually see the level of detail that we get with the different site sizes as well. So you can see that it's a lot more detailed once we drop this down to a site size of small. We can also switch over to soil moisture so we have our moist and our dry zones. In addition to being able to export these to 3D rendering softwares, you can also export these to Revit, where you can actually replace the plants with uh, RPC families and actual plants in Revit as well. All right, well, thank you for joining us for the Landkit Planting Workflow tutorial. If you have any questions, please check out our website and look up some more tutorials and descriptions and explanations on that website. You can also uh, join our office hours, which happen twice a week, uh, to get free Landkit support and help with how to utilize these workflows. Um, but also reach out through email if you have any questions or concerns or bugs. Thank you.